verse 5. People think you've got to work to get to heaven. You've got to earn it. But the Bible says in verse 5 of chapter 4, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Look at chapter 5 and verse number 5. No greater message than that. And uh, we love him for all that he's done for us. All right, well, at this time, it's uh, time for our children to be dismissed to Children's Church. And I know that they'll enjoy their time together this morning. And we will begin by turning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, please, this morning. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. Uh, we have finished a several month series in the book of Romans from chapter 1 to chapter 5 looking at the systematic theology of justification or salvation and we had a little message last week on the journey of the lost soul just to remind us all uh, what it is that he's saving us from and thank God for salvation and if you're saved today you're not lost if you're lost you're not seen it's either one or the other well after we get saved uh, you know, we, the Lord didn't take us to heaven when we got saved. He left us here with a purpose. And we're going to start a new series this morning that I've entitled Discipleship 101. Now, if you've been to college, you know that 101 is the, the very basic lessons. And so we're going to start uh, this morning. This will be a several-week uh, series looking at the subject of discipleship. And I hope it will be a great encouragement and, and hopefully practical for all of us uh, by the time we get finished with it. Now we're going to read this morning from the Gospel of Luke chapter 14 from verse 25 uh, through verse number 33. And so if you're able, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word this morning in Luke chapter 14 and verse number 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand, or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace, and so likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Dear Father, help us to understand your word today. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth. Help us to connect the dots. Give us understanding. And Lord, we pray that your perfect will would be done in each one of our lives. Where we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, please. And if you would be seated. Now, some of these messages, uh, some of you will have heard before, and I don't apologize for that, because really, if it's worth preaching once, it's worth, worth preaching again. Uh, but we will be adding to uh, the other discipleship messages that we've done in the past, and we're hoping actually toward the end of the study to hand you a little discipleship booklet that we will produce, Discipleship 101, and there's many practical things in there. Uh, that we'll go through in the latter part of this series. Now, it seems that most people, obviously, would have heard of Jesus and his 12 disciples. And, of course, 11 of those went on to be apostles, uh, added with Matthias or Paul, uh, I suppose you could say, uh, who were the 12 apostles of the Lamb. But you did, did you know that Jesus wants you to be one of his disciples? Yeah. And we could ask the question this morning, are you? Are you a disciple of Jesus? Now, the title of our message this morning is The Contradiction of Discipleship. And it seems the use of the word contradiction in the title might signal that there's a problem here in our understanding. Uh, now, there's never a contradiction in the Bible. I've been studying the Bible for 43 years. There's not one contradiction in it. Um, and we have uh, studied it very thoroughly in those 43 years. But there is contradictions in religion. 
And there's contradictions in the views that uh, believers would have among themselves. And to be honest with you, sometimes there's even contradictions within our own hearts. But there's no contradiction in the Bible. <clears throat> but I hope to help you to see what this contradiction is in our thinking. And I want to help us to understand the Bible's answer for it. And our subject today is one of the most misunderstood concepts for both unsaved people and saved people alike. And, and really can be introduced by a question. And the question is this, what does God require for salvation? Now, if you've been here for the last six months, you should be able to have an answer. And you should be able to give us verses for that, having gone through the book of Romans. But we want to start out thinking about the idea of the contradiction of discipleship. Now, in this passage we have read, Jesus explains to the multitude that discipleship costs. Discipleship costs. And sometimes it will cost a lot. Discipleship means that you're a follower of the Lord Jesus, that he is your teacher, uh, your master, your Lord, and your first allegiance is to him with no competition from anything else. In fact, that's what we read here as we go through this passage. Look again at verse 26. He says, If anyone come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters. Now, wait a minute. The Bible teaches to love one another. But what he's, so what is he saying here? He's saying, listen, if you come to me, then the, your relationship with me supersedes all those other relationships. And really your love for me as compared to your love for your parents or your wife or your children, your brothers and sisters, your love for me should far exceed uh, the love that you have for your family. You see, sometimes when you follow the Lord, you have to make a decision, is it going to be the Lord or is it going to be my family? I was only safe uh, really two months and I said to my parents, I believe the Lord's uh, calling me to go to Bible school to prepare to serve him. And they were not in agreement. Um, and it was interesting how the Lord put that together because um, uh, they, they surrendered me to the Lord when I was a little baby. I was dedicated in the Pentecostal church when I was a few months old. And uh, they thought about it that night. And the next morning I went to see them and they said, well, you know, we gave you to the Lord when you were born and we can't take you back now. We still are very uncomfortable about it and a good reason to be uncomfortable. But you see, for me on my part, and what I said to them, I love you, I respect you, but whether you bless me or not, I'm still going to go. And you know, when I set a foot on that 747 in Dublin Airport in 1979, and it was a very heart-wrenching thing for an 18-year-old to leave his family and to leave everything anew because of the calling of God. And sometimes your family might not like what you decide to do for the Lord. And this is where this cost comes in. So it may cost you your family relationships to follow Christ. Also, it may even cost you your own life. He goes on in verse 26. He says, yeah, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. If you don't hate your own life also, you cannot be my disciple. And so the bar here is very high. The cost is great. In verse 27, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So this discipleship may indeed cost you a lot of comfort and a lot of ease. It may mean hardship and difficult experiences in your life to follow Christ. And then in verse 33, it says uh, in verse number 33, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Discipleship may cost you everything. And so because of that, in verse 28, he says that the disciple should count the cost. In verse 28, he says, if you're going to build a tower, if you're going to build anything, we're going to be building a yeah, building here, where this is always in my mind, you know. Uh, if you counted the cost, then, you know, uh, this is like a million dollar building. We maybe got about half of that, so we don't have enough to finish. But is the will there to finish it, whether the money's in the bank or not? I think that's really what it's, what it's saying there, you know. Um, he says, uh, set it not down first and count it the cost, whether he is sufficient to finish it. And when we start this thing, God help us and God willing, we will finish it. Amen. We don't know how long it's going to take or what's, what it's going to cost, but we will finish what we start. God help us. Yeah. 
And so being a disciple is the same way. You've got, it's going to cost you, and you've got to sit down and consider uh, the, the, kind, the, the cost. In verse 28 and verse 29, he says, I want you to finish what you start. In verse 29, after he hath laid the foundation, and he's not able to finish, and all that behold it begin to mock. He talks about a man starting a war. You know, it's easy to start a building program. It's not so easy to finish it. It's really easy to start a war. But can you finish the war? That's the thing. Now, the important thing that we're getting at here in this passage, the important question is this. Do you have to be a disciple to go to heaven when you die? Do you have to be a disciple to go to heaven when you die? Now, some Christians say yes. There are those who teach um, lordship salvation, which basically means that all these, all these verses that have to do to, with discipleship and counting the costs and so on, they apply that to salvation, and they see no distinction between discipleship and salvation. They believe it's the same thing. But if that's true, then there is a contradiction. You say, why is there a contradiction? Because the Bible clearly teaches that salvation, going to heaven, is the free gift of God. The Bible teaches us salvation is free. And you're getting into the really, really uh, uh, dicey doctrine when you start to say, well, I've started my salvation and I have to finish my salvation. Did you start your salvation? Are you going to have to finish your salvation? There's a problem here in our thinking. Now keep your place there. And let's go back to the book of Romans where we left off a couple of weeks ago. And I just want to point out, and we've done this before as we went through Romans, I just want to point out to you the fact that the Bible clearly teaches that going to heaven is not something you deserve. It's not something you earn. It's something that he did for us, not something we do for him. Salvation is the gift of God and it's free. Now it's really, really expensive. That's why it's free, by the way. It's so expensive that there's nothing you could, you, could, you, could, you can't come up with the price for your own salvation. It's too expensive for us to have to pay. And so God paid it for us. And when we try to pay him back, it's a, you know, that's an insult. We've got to receive it as a free gift. Now look what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 24. He says, being justified. Being is present tense. Justified means that we are declared righteous. We're saved. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Look at chapter 4 and verse 5. People think you've got to work to get to heaven. You've got to earn it. But the Bible says in verse 5 of chapter 4, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Look at chapter 5 and verse number 15. We were here just two weeks ago. In verse 15, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. He's comparing our condemnation in Adam and salvation in the last Adam, the Lord Jesus. He calls it the free gift. Uh, later on in that verse, he says, uh, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Verse 16, but not as, uh, but not as it was by, by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one on the condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses to justification. Verse 17, much more they which receive, that's how you get a gift, you receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Not your righteousness, God's righteousness given to you as a gift. Verse 18, therefore, as by the offense of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, Jesus, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now, it doesn't say everybody's going to be justified. It doesn't say, it doesn't say everybody's going to be saved. But the free gift is offered. It's available to every single person. Jesus said to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me the drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Ephesians 2 at 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Bible is very, very clear that salvation is the gift of God. Amen. Now, some people, religious people especially, will take two things that are opposite. Discipleship costs, salvation is free, 
And they'll put that together and they'll say, well, this is just a mystery. We can't really understand all of that. Now, that's poppycock. That's just not so. God knows how to say things that are clear. He wants us to understand the truth of God. And what we're saying is that salvation is the free gift of God. And if that's the truth, then salvation and discipleship are the same thing. No, they're different. If they're the same thing, it's a contradiction. Salvation and discipleship are two different concepts. And so it's not a contradiction It's a contrast. So that's my second point. The contrast of discipleship. So it is true that discipleship costs. It is also true that salvation is free. But there's no contradiction here. Because they're two different things altogether. And this is how, you see, if you study the Bible and you, you, you just study what it says, you'll come up with these answers and you'll see it for yourself. And see, it's a very dangerous thing when people think, well, I've got to do this to be saved, and I've got to do that to be saved. When all through the scriptures, the Bible says, you know, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said unto him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I shall be saved. You see, salvation is something that God does freely for you. It's too expensive for us to do it for ourselves. So salvation is something God does for you. Discipleship is something you do for God. Now, is discipleship trying to get brownie points with God to make us righteous? No, that's the gift of God. That's salvation in Jesus Christ. But there is something that God wants us to do. And we'll we'll talk about that in just a moment. But salvation involves Christ bearing his cross. Discipleship, according to these verses, uh, means involves you bearing your cross. It's two different things. Salvation costs God everything. Discipleship costs you everything. Salvation costs God everything. His own dear son were bought with the precious blood of Christ without blemish and without spot. It doesn't cost us anything, but discipleship will cost us. Salvation comes by believing through faith. Discipleship is serving. And it does involve works and discipline and sometimes difficult experiences and hardship. Now, I want you to go over to, well, let me just show you this first. Salvation is when we come to Christ. Salvation happens when we come to Christ. Discipleship happens when we follow after Christ. Now, there's a distinction, and we'll show that to you. First of all here, if you go back to Luke chapter uh, 14, you'll notice how verse 26 starts out. It says, Jesus says, if any man come to me, comma. Now, before you can ever be a disciple, a true disciple, you have to come to the Lord. You can't really follow after the Lord unless you come to the Lord. But, but the thing is, that actually can happen. But as far as what's legitimate and what God's will is, he wants you to come to him. And when you come to him, you're coming looking for salvation. You're receiving him as your savior. And then if you look down... Um, In verse 27, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me. You see, there's a difference between between coming to a person and coming after a person. And I think it is possible, and we'll see this in just a little bit, that you have, here's the Lord and he's walking along and people will come behind him and they're following the Lord. And they're learning his teaching. They're sitting listening to his word and they're learning his principles and his teaching. And they're walking after the Lord. They're following the Lord. They're trying to be a disciple, and in some sense, they they are a disciple. But you know, the same person is never, Lord, Lord, and come to the Lord and have the Lord face you and say, Lord, I need to be saved. I need you to save me because I'm a sinner and I deserve punishment, and Lord, I want you to be my Savior. You see, the proper order is to come to him first and then follow after him second. Now let's see how that works. If you look back at Matthew chapter number 11, please. Matthew chapter 11. And notice, here's two verses we all know very well. And I believe these two verses um, show the distinction between coming to and coming after. I think these two verses uh, show the distinction between salvation and discipleship. In verse number 29 Uh, Or sorry, verse number 28, you have salvation. Notice how he says it in verse 28. Come unto me. Not come after me, but come to me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give 
you rest. That's salvation rest. Salvation rest is given to you by the Savior when you come to him, when you believe upon him. And so I believe, verse 20 is talking about salvation. But then in verse 29, he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So verse 28, it's a given rest. Verse 29 is a found rest. And in verse 29, he's speaking about, really, service. And we're going to talk about this more next week. Um, And it's not forced upon you. It's our decision to take the yoke. Now, you know what a yoke is. It yokes animals together. Uh, not when they're going to the pasture to feed or to frolic in the back 40, but it means that those animals are going to be yoked together to serve and to work and to labor. And I think verse 29 is speaking about discipleship. So salvation first, then discipleship. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we'll come back to that next time. But let's go over to John chapter uh, 6 for just a moment. John chapter 6. Because I want to show you that this phrase, coming to Christ, is salvation. Because in this verse, in John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now, sometimes the Bible does that. It'll say one thing, and then it'll say a different thing, but the, different, the second thing is, the, is really the same as the first thing, what it's just said in a different way. Right. And so what he's saying, if you come to me, coming to me is the same thing as believing upon me. If you come to me, you'll never hunger. If you believe upon me, you'll never thirst. That's the same thing. Coming to Christ is salvation. Look down, interestingly, um, Well, verse 36 says, But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. Now he's speaking, of course, to the Pharisees here and those uh, who uh, weren't coming to Christ. Now the interesting thing is in verse 37. He says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast down. Now this is a verse that people think, Well, this is the elect. You know, God has chosen the elect and the elect will certainly come to Jesus. But I want you to just think with me for just a moment. Look at John chapter 5 and verse 17. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is presented as divine. In other words, he is God on the earth. In fact, he says in verse 23, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. If Jesus is not God, that would be blasphemy. And basically what Jesus is teaching here through the Gospel of John is that up until, well, let's look at verse 17. But Jesus answered and answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. And what he means by that, before I, get, before I came here, before I was, began my ministry, before he, he was God in the flesh, before he came, God the Father was at work. In fact, um, if you uh, look over at verse uh, 37 of chapter 5, I'm sorry, of chapter 6, verse 37, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Now, what that, I think what that means is this. It uh, uh, is that, um, and we'll see this actually later on. In chapter, look at chapter 6, verse 47. In fact, look at verse 44. <laughs> no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all, how many people? All, what? Taught of God. Before Jesus got here, the Father was always teaching. God is always at work in the lives and hearts of men to give them the truth. He says that everybody, the prophets say that they shall all be taught of God. Then notice the last part of verse 45. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father... See, the question is not that God is, is drawing. Or it's not the, the, the question is not, is God, is God teaching? Um, because he says all people are taught of God. The question is, are we, are we listening? He says, um, every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. So the question is, before Jesus got here, were there saved people here? Were there saved people like Anna and Simeon and And even Nathaniel, I believe Nathaniel was saved before he met Jesus. 
I think the, the, the disciples were saved before they met Jesus. Were people saved before Jesus came on the, on the scene? Of course they were. Okay, so is there the possibility that somebody was saved, like in the Old Testament, through the Father's teaching, and then Jesus comes along? Is there a possibility that that person who knows the Father wouldn't know Jesus? Wouldn't come to Jesus? Impossible. And that's why he says in John chapter uh, 6 and verse 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. There's no possibility of an Old Testament saint rejecting Jesus Christ. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. But what he's saying is, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. God the Father was teaching people, but now I am here. And by the way, he's not here now, but there's somebody else here. The third person of the Holy Spirit, uh, the f- third person of the Godhead, who is the Holy Spirit. And we're to learn of him and listen to him. And if you'll learn of him and you receive his word, you will come to Christ too. Yeah. And so that's what he's saying. It's kind of like a, in a relay race where the baton's handed off to the next runner and then it's handed off to the, the Father worketh hitherto, and I'm here and I work. And all, all men should honor the Son as they honor the Father. And so all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And then he says, And he that cometh to me, I will in the ways cast out. Amen. He says, I am here. And if you haven't been saved under my Father, but I am here and you're listening to me, if you will come to me, I will save you, and you'll never be cast out. Amen. I'm simply saying that Jesus says, when you come to him, that is salvation. Now, when we study discipleship, we find a contrast. They are not the same. Now, let's move on to the consequences, the consequences of discipleship. Is discipleship a contradiction? Nope. Is it, is it a contrast? Yep. It's two different concepts, two different things, discipleship and salvation. And so I repeat the question, do you have to be a disciple to go to heaven when you die? What takes you to heaven? The Bible teaches is believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ, not being a disciple, but being a believer. So let's turn to John chapter 6, and you might already be there. John chapter 6. So the question is, we'll have here in these verses a question about Judas. Judas was named with the twelve. Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, was a disciple of Jesus Christ. But was Judas a believer in Jesus Christ? And the answer to that is no. You say, how do you know that? Well, because the Bible tells us. So let's look here at John chapter 6 and verse number 60. Some important truths here in this passage. He said, many therefore of his disciples when they had heard this. Now this is about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And they're like, you know, this is a hard saying. Who can hear this? But they were misunderstanding what Jesus said. Let me ask you, you know, the Roman Catholics get this wrong because they think that they, through transubstantiation, turn the body of, uh, the, the bread is turned into the actual body of Christ. Let me ask you something. He said, I'm the bread. Uh, look at verse 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven. He's speaking about himself. Did Jesus' body come down from heaven? Where did Jesus' body originate? Here on the earth, in the womb of Mary. The body of Jesus was not in heaven until he ascended to the Father. And so his body didn't come down. And yet he says, I am the bread of God that came down from heaven. When you eat me, you have life. Now, it's an illustration, just like the Lord's Supper. In other words, bread is life. If you don't eat, you're going to die. And spiritually, Jesus Christ is our bread. We are completely, utterly dependent upon him, his death, burial, and resurrection for our eternal life and for our salvation. And he is our bread. He is our life. And when we trust him, when we believe upon him, then the Bible says we have life, life eternal. But his disciples were not getting this. And so... In verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? And the word offend is a stumbling block. 
Do you know there's all kinds of stumbling blocks on your path? There's all kinds of things that you will not understand that are hard to hear. I, you know, I just, I, I don't understand this. I've had that all through my Christian life. There's things that I didn't understand. I didn't know what God was doing. And you know what the answer, the simple answer is this, just trust him anyway. Amen. Just hold on to his hand in the dark and let him bring you through. Because here's what I've experienced. If you just trust God in the dark and you don't understand He'll bring you through it and you'll get, you'll get to a place where you'll look back and say, oh, I understand now. Yeah. But you see, if I allow that thing to stop me and become a stumbling block to me, I'll never get to that place of understanding. Some people want to understand so that they can believe. Really, the, the answer is believe so that you can understand. I know it's back to front, but that's the way God works. If you believe him, one day you'll understand. But this became an offense to them, a stumbling block to them. Verse 62, what? And if he shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And look at verse 64. Jesus said, but there are some of you that believe not. Now, wait a minute. He just talked about the disciples, verse 60. Here you have people who were disciples, but were not believers. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not. And by the way, it's more than one. And who should betray him. Who was that? That was Judas. Verse 70. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. In verse 64, he helps us to understand that Judas never, ever believed upon him. What does it mean to believe upon him? It means to see your need of him and to put your faith and trust in Jesus as your hope, as your saviour. Judas wasn't doing that. I'll tell you what Judas was looking at. This is the Messiah. This is the king. And guess what? I'm one of his... I'm one of his top echelons, and he was. <coughs> Judas is one of, the, uh, one of the most trusted disciples. How do you know that? Because he held a bag. He was the treasurer. And when Jesus said on the night of, of, of his betrayal, he says, one of you is going to betray me. And they said, they looked up, they looked at one another, and they said, Lord, is it me? They didn't say, ah, oh, yes, we knew all along it was Judas. They had no idea it was Judas. You know, there's probably people right in here that are disciples and not believers. You know what the consequences are for being a disciple and not a believer? It means you will never go to heaven. It means you're on the journey of the lost soul. Where did, where did Judas go? He went on to his own place, Jesus said. He went to hell. He was a devil. And in fact, the Bible says that Satan entered into him that night. Now, what I'm saying is this, is the consequences of believing on Christ, which Judas didn't do, is eternal life. All the Bible, I can't stress enough, the Bible is so consistent. All, just open it and read it for yourself. The Bible says that we're saved by faith. Look at verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So short, so simple, so wonderful. You see, following Jesus will not take you to heaven. And I'm telling you, there's a bunch of people. I preached a message not too long ago about Cain and Abel. Do you remember? Because the lamb must be first. Why did, why did God reject Cain's offering? It was a, a legitimate offering later on in the Old Testament. But the problem was it was out of order. It was, a, it was a thanksgiving offering. It was a worship offering. When Abel brought his offering, it was a blood offering, which is a sin offering. You have to have the sin offering first. You have to come to Christ first. Before your following after Christ becomes legitimate. You must offer the blood offering first. Before the thanksgiving offering. The worship offering is legitimate before God. And I made the point. I've run into hundreds and hundreds of people. Yes. I knock on their door. Hello. Yes I'm from such and such Baptist church. And we're out visiting the area today. And we want to talk to you about the Lord. And it's lovely to meet you today. Now do you go to church anywhere? And the wee woman says to me. Oh yes, 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 yes. I've been going to church for 45 years. Wonderful. What church do you go to? Well, I go to the Church of Ireland. Well, that's wonderful. I was telling them it was wonderful. It's probably not, but I mean, the thing is, if somebody's going to church, that's a good thing, better than not going to church maybe. But, you know, you're just trying to open the door. And then I say this, well, now, that's wonderful that you go to the Church of Ireland, Anglican Church. Um, now, are you a saved Church of Ireland person? Do you know the Lord is your Savior? Oh, no, son, no, 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 never been saved. No, no, don't do that. 
and, and I think to myself, well, what are, you going to, what are you doing when you go to church? Right. Well, you know, what they're going, you know what they're doing as lost people when they, go, when they go to church? It's the same thing you're doing. They're singing the songs. They're worshiping God. It's true from their heart. But man has this innate ability, this, this God-given need to worship. Even lost people worship. And they learn the principles of the Bible and the, the Beatitudes and all the wonderful teachings of the Lord Jesus. And here's what they're doing. They're following after Christ, but they've never come to Christ. So I think churches are filled. Uh, old, old, old-timey churches, old denominational churches, and the modern churches. In the modern churches, it's all about worship. And they've got the, the entertainment going and the band going and all the rest of it. Never going to stand there doing the worship thing. And they feel like they're following after Christ. But have you ever come to Christ? Because being a disciple will not take you to heaven. Being a believer will take you to heaven. Judas went to hell. The consequences of believing upon Christ is eternal life. Well, now, what are the consequences of being a disciple? Because salvation is free. Thank God it's free. It depends upon what he does, not what what I do. That's why we can never lose our salvation. Thank God for that. You can be secure in Christ and know that heaven is your home. And what a joy that is. We're going to talk about this next time about why you should be a believer. But what are the consequences of being a disciple? What are the consequences of being a disciple? It's not the salvation of the soul, but it is the salvation of your life. Now, there was a man who died with Jesus. There were two men that died with Jesus. And it, really, it's, it just pictures humanity. Yeah. Thief on his left hand, thief on his right hand. Both of the thieves at the beginning of, at nine o'clock, both of them were reviling him. But by the time they got to 12 o'clock, and the, one of the thieves on the left hand started to revile Jesus, and the other thief stood up for him. He said, wait a second, whoa, whoa, whoa. This man doesn't deserve, we, be, we deserve to be here, this man doesn't. Well, why, what changed his mind? Well, he saw Jesus and what he said and what he did and what he didn't do for three hours. And the man was convinced that this man, he is who he says he is. And you know what happened? The thief on the right side turned to Jesus and he said this, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That man just believed. You see, well, what, Jesus is going to die on the cross. What kingdom? Lord, He recognized who he was. He recognized the cross was not the end for Jesus, that he really was the king of Israel. And he cried out in mercy to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and he says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, was that man on the cross a disciple? No, he wasn't. He was a bad man. But he received Christ. He believed upon him. And he was saved. He was a believer. That's the thing that takes him to heaven. His life was over. Now, when you got saved, God didn't take you to heaven immediately. This year, I'll be 43 years. I can't believe it's been that long. 43 years I've been saved. The Lord didn't take me to heaven. Probably would have been better for us to go to heaven when we first got saved. But God has a plan to leave us here. He wants to do something with us. He wants to use us. But not only that, um, Jesus said this, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. You're saying, I don't want this discipleship thing. I'm going to do my own thing. I don't want to be submitted to this, this process of discipline and hardship. He wants that. I'm going to do my own thing. You go ahead and do that. God gives you the freedom to do that. And you know what's going to happen? One day you'll wake up and you say, I've just wasted my life. I serve myself, I serve pleasure, and at the end of your life, you're going to say it was all wasted. You see, you can't keep your life. It's going to go one way or the other. But Jesus says, if you will lose your life for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall save it. And honestly, that's what I find. People thought I was nuts to go to Bible school and leave my whole life behind, my family, my, my job and all of that. And people thought I was crazy. But you know what? God led me every step of the way and I found my life and I found my niche and I found my reason and I found my gift and God has given me my life. I believe if I was still, I probably would have backslid and be back on the drink and probably in the gutter and and, uh, I might not even be alive today if I did my own thing. You see, being a disciple means finding your purpose, finding your life, finding your fulfillment because even a Christian you know, if you're doing your own thing and, you're, and God is not part of that, we learned that on Thursday night. Brother Robert was teaching on Ecclesiastes. And Solomon basically says this, 
Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Everything under the sun. You take God out of it and you can have uh, achievements and riches and fame and pleasure to the nth degree. But if God is not part of that picture, it's empty, it's worthless, it's meaningless. That's what he said. And he's the poster boy. Solomon had everything. But that was the conclusion of the whole matter. He'd take God out of it. And so as believers... If we leave God out of our picture, we will not be fulfilled. You know, we talk about the God-shaped void, the lost people, and you can put sin in there, but it'll never satisfy, and that's true. But even as believers, if we don't have God in our life and serving God for eternal things, we'll miss it. And we will not be fulfilled, and we will not have the joy that discipleship brings. It means being useful to God. Jesus said this, come ye after me. What is that? That's discipleship. Yeah. Didn't say come to He says, come ye after me and I will make you to become fishers of men. Yeah. Eternal things. Touching another life and help them to believe the gospel. And that person just went from hell to heaven because of your influence. I mean, yeah. who's, who's sufficient for these things? It, remain, it, it means rewards here. He'll tell you that later on. Um, if you give anything up for the Lord in this life, he'll give you a hundredfold in this life and in, in rewards in the life to come. Rewards here, rewards in heaven. It means walking with Christ and walking after Christ and discovering him and discovering yourself. Discipleship's wonderful. Yeah. And you really find out who you were supposed to be. You really find out why God made you in the first place. He didn't take you to heaven, he left you here. But he left you here with purpose. It's a wonderful thing. The consequences of discipleship are wonderful. Now it'll cost you. It'll cost you dearly. And when we get into the character of discipleship next time. And we look at what, what all that means. And we're going to give you the, the motivation why you should do it anyway. But, but it's going to cost you. But I'm going to tell you something. The reward is brilliant. The reward is great. Yeah. In fact he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am making lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. We're going to see this next time. Because everybody's got a burden. And everybody's got a yoke. But if you're under Christ somehow. It's a delightful burden. The burdens you find in life outside of Christ doing your own thing, the way of the transgressor is hard. So we're going we're to spend our lives one way or the other. And the Lord says, if you invest your life for eternity and follow me, he says, you will be happy. You'll be happy now, and you'll be happy later on. Are you a disciple? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? I hope by the time we get through with the series, you will really consider that and make, if you're not already, move in the right direction about following him and discovering. Part of the series is you're going to discover, we're going to give you a spiritual evaluation, a spiritual gifts test. You know, if you're saved, did you have at least one spiritual gift? Mm-hmm. Say, why is that important? Because that's your place in the body. That's your niche. That's the thing that you're built for. And uh, some Christians don't even know what it is. So we're going to try to help you to find that out. We're going to discuss some of those things later on. But let me ask you this as we're closing. Are you a believer? Because that's the only thing that will take you to heaven. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. You know, it's not following after Christ that takes you to heaven. It's coming to Christ and receiving him. Putting your faith and trust for heaven in him. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Lord I come to you and you do business with God. Understanding your need. And receive the gift of eternal life. He came unto his own. His own received him not. But as many as received him. To them give he power to become the sons of God. Receive him. Come to him. Believe upon him. And be saved. And then after you get saved. You can be a disciple. Father, thank you for your precious word. And Lord, we're so grateful that counting the cost and finishing what we started has nothing to do with salvation. Because we didn't start our salvation and we didn't finish our salvation. It was Jesus on the cross that said, it is finished. And the work that you did for us is all sufficient. 
Lord, there may be people in here today who are disciples, and they're, they're lovely people, and they're, they're genuine people, and they love you, and they, they, they worship you, and they thank you. But Lord, they've never come to you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help them to see that that is something that needs to happen. To come to you as their saviour. And then afterwards we can follow after you as our master. We must be saved first. Judas was lost, though we followed you. Lord, I pray that you'll give enlightenment and help and understanding in these things. And help us, Lord, in our study. See of the lost, Lord, and encourage every believer. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our song.